Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you here. I, I have a feeling we are going to have others trickling in, so if there's any seat that's beside you, you might want to move in, and uh, here we go. Come on in. There's some seats right here, and there's a seat there and a seat up there, so let's just make sure all the seats are taken right on the inside. My name is Shauna Sylvester, and I uh, am the director of the Center for Dialogue, but also the... Uh, the uh, Director of Carbon Talks in Renewable Cities. And it is such a delight to welcome you today to our Carbon Talks. I'd like to say welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, through webcasting as well. We have a couple of things we want to make note of. Um, our hashtag, SustyBC, there's been a conversation going on there in terms of sustainable issues on that hashtag, and then at Carbon Talks. If you would like, um, if you are in the webcasting world and you'd like to send us a question during the dialogue period, um, please just use the hashtag and we will have one of our staff read out your question and try and get to it. How many of you have been to a Carbon Talk before? Oh, good. So, you know. There are a few virgins in the room, and that's all right. Um, just to let you know, we go through fairly quickly with our presentations. Uh, eight minutes. Each one of our presenters knows that they have eight minutes, and we're pretty brutal on that front. Um, and then so that the time is really left for a conversation with each of you. So what we'll do as well in the conversations is we'll often take a couple of questions at a time so we can move through as many questions as possible. And then, and that way, the Presenters will be copying down those questions and then taking them in groups and answering them in groups. We are thrilled today to have such a great group of people presenting to us and on such an issue that has been so important, very important here at SFU. Let's see, are there any people from the Divest SFU community here? Fantastic. Welcome, and uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, hopefully at least one of you will have a chance to ask a question on, on, on this. We, we certainly want to profile some of your work as well. Um, I want to, first of all, do a thank you to two organizations that really make this possible, and that's the North Growth Foundation that has been one of the founders, uh, founding partners with Carbon Talks, and PICS, which is the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. They're also our sponsor of these Carbon Talks, so I wanted to acknowledge them. Um, this is an issue on divestment that is really coming up uh, in a way we haven't seen, I think, since those of us that were involved in the anti-apartheid movement um, got in, saw in terms of divestment campaigns. This is something where you're seeing campaigns really moving on university camp campuses. And what we wanted to do with Carbon Talks was really take a step back and look at the whole context of the divestment movement and get some people uh, into, our, into the audience that would really open up the conversation, not in a polarized way, but really raise it in terms of the questions that we might want to ask. And we've asked three people to do that. Certainly, um, Councillor Reimer is no stranger to this room. I think you've probably done many presentations over the years here at SFU, and certainly has been um, involved with many carbon talks. Um, Councillor Reimer is uh, originally came to City Council as a school board member, uh, I believe the first elected Green Party member um, in 2002, and, and had a real, really compelled by Mayor Gregor Robertson's leadership and Vision's leadership, she joined City Council in 2008. Uh, she's been the chair of City's Planning and Environment Committee and Council, and has led the award-winning Greenest City Action Plan. She's overseen Vancouver's efforts really to be a green leader here. Prior to being on City Council, Andrea was the Executive Director of the Wilderness Committee and so has a long, long tradition in environmental activism. And she was also trained uh, and selected to be trained by Al Gore to deliver an Inconvenient Truth PowerPoint and did that throughout the country. So Andrea is going to speak for eight minutes. She is going to be followed by Mark Lee. And again, Mark is not a stranger to this room either. Mark has uh, spoken on a number of things, including natural gas. Um, he's been a progressive commentator in Canada and, and particularly in BC on social and economic issues. Since 2008, Mark has been the co-director of the Climate Justice Project, and that is a research partnership with UBC funded with the Shirk Grant. Uh, Mark is the past chair of the Progressive Economics Forum, and he holds MAs in economics from SFU and from the University of Western Ontario. And following Mark will be Jamie Bonham. 
Jamie is the manager of extractive research and engagement for NEI Investments. And Jamie has over eight years of experience in researching and engaging with com companies on environment and social issues in the extractive sector. At NEI, he is responsible for managing the extractive industry corporate engagement program and con conducting direct collaborative dialogues aimed at mitigating risks for companies within the NEI portfolio. Jamie is responsible for the analysis of company performance and industry's trends in environmental social governance issues in order to support NEI's work to promote the stakeholder theory of the firm, namely that the social purpose of a corporation is to provide returns to all stakeholders, not just shareholders. So I'd like to get us started with Andrea, and uh, followed by Mark and then Jamie. Thank you, Shauna. Um, I'll start by acknowledging the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil Waututh Nations. Um, today, we um, named for the first time in the modern era of Vancouver a city facility in the Hulkaminam language um, with the support of the Musqueam and the Squamish and the Tsleil Waututh. So, uh, an important day for us to think about that acknowledgement and what it means to us as a city. Um, so. I have to admit, um, <laughs> there's a bunch of reasons I'm not very good at politics, um, and one of them is that I don't actually like politics that much. Um, <laughs> second one is that I don't actually enjoy debate that much, this concept of for or against and all of that. I, I like collaboration and dialogue and how you come to some common solutions. So I, I bring that up because if you're... If you came expecting a debate today, um, hopefully you can adjust your expectations to more of um, a dialogue. Um, and as you'll hear in my remarks, um, the city has taken some actions, but we're um, in a place where we're seeking more information, seeking more understanding of the issue and community values around it to figure out what our next step would be, particularly as it relates to pension funds um, and the city of Vancouver. So many of you may know that Vancouver has an aspiration to be the greenest city in the world by the year 2020. Um, that work's been ongoing um, pretty much since day two in office. Day one was um, spent working um, urgently on launching our, our campaign to end homelessness in the city. So day two was Greenest City Action Plan. Um, in the time since we launched the initiative, we, have, um, we get a report every July on our progress on our 10 target areas. We have managed to reduce water use by 18% in, what are we looking at, five, four years now? Um, waste in the city of Vancouver is down by 40%. Um, act active transportation is up by 10%. We've created 3,200 new green jobs. We've created literally dozens and dozens and dozens of new um, food processing, production, and other capacity, as well as several thousand new um, community gardens for people to, to grow food in. And overall in the city, um, greenhouse gases are down 6%, which is an impressive feat at a time when our population is growing. So that means individual emissions are down quite substantially. Two things gravely threaten all of those gains. Um, first, Kinder Morgan Pipeline. Um, the Kinder Morgan Pipeline expansion, if approved, in three days would wipe out all those gains. Three days of increased production um, would, mid, would offset all the GHG gains, all the water gains, all the waste gains that we have made as a city. Uh, so no, not surprising that we're out there <laughs> trying to fight that um, with, with as much vigor as we can. Um, the other thing though, and this has been a worry since day one, is that you know we wake up in the morning we put in these 15-hour days to like really try and move the needle on all these policy areas that we're working on. And eventually we collapse into bed at night, and yet our money as a city, which totals in the billions of dollars, is sitting in a financial institution doing God knows what while we're sleeping. Um, I'm a former uh, president of a credit union, so very familiar with how, how money moves around at night when you're sleeping. Um, <laughs> and it's something that has been a great concern to me from day one with Green City, but really back in 2009, 2010, um, nobody was having this discussion, or, or very few people. There were some early adopters pushing on the divestment discussion, but it was a tough one to get on people's radar screens, and frankly, there's no greater taboo in our society. We can talk about sex in this room right now, and happy to do that after if you want to, <laughs> um, but we're probably not going to all go one by one and talk about how much money we make for a living or what the size of our portfolios are. And, you know, as a kid, if you go to your grandma's house and you ask your grandma for money, because last time you were there, she gave you money, and you're like, where's my quarter or my dollar or my two bucks? 
your parents are like, oh my god, I can't believe you just asked your grandma for money. And this all goes back to the taboo we have about talking about money. And as a result of that, we're not super literate about what's happening with our money. So uh, in 2012, you know, the literacy level was raised more in the general public. My sense of anxiety over it was definitely at a sort of fever pitch. Um, Seattle had taken some bold moves. Um, and we were able to take, as a city council, the first step. Very small step, which was to say, hey, what is our money doing at night? Not, not an action, but just why don't we find out where our money is and what it's doing. Uh, staff went off to investigate that incredible, right, that we don't, I mean, certainly they know where our money is, but it's not screened through anything other than uh, low-risk investment and um, liquidity. Like, we need to get access to cash at reasonably regular intervals as a city. So those are the two things that we're looking at um, when we're making investments. Uh, so it came back in 2013. There was some good news. The city's, there's sort of two sides to this. The city's money, the direct investments of you pay your property taxes or your parking tickets or your dog licenses, all that money is in investments that are not fossil fuels. Um, they are low risk and they can be cashed out when they need to be, um, but they're not fossil fuels. The bad news was on the pension fund side. Um, the pension fund is not only heavily invested in fossil fuels, it's also invested in weapons, tobacco, um, industries that regardless of your opinion on whether or not climate change is happening, you probably don't want your money sitting in a bank at night buying guns that are killing somebody, somebody somewhere in the world. Uh, so that was obviously quite concerning. So as a result of that, we undertook, we're, we're working now on two actions. On the city side, um, yes, we have no money directly invested in fossil fuels, but what a fantastic time then to put a screen in to make sure that there's zero risk. There's not a single city dollar that is at risk from us putting a screen in place so that in the future the money can't go into fossil fuel investments or weapons for tobacco um, or, or other things that would be inconsistent with the policy goals that we advance collectively on behalf of the residents of Vancouver. So we have a working group. Uh, Mark's a member of it. I think there's some... Oh, there's not others here. I saw some others wandering around the foyer who might be here. Um, and we're working on a, a very preliminary screen. The hope over time is to get three things in place. A negative screen, things we would not invest in under any circumstances. Uh, a best-in-class screen, so things that we would invest in, but we'd be looking for the best-in-class within those categories. Um, but also a positive screen, so that we're not just not investing in bad things, but actually actively investing in the kinds of things that we'd like to see mobilized out there in the world. Unfortunately, those toasts tend to be higher risk and lower liquidity, so that's gonna be a challenging piece to pull together. And um, the last piece that we're working that I'll, I'll leave with you is the pension side, where I am neither for nor against, um, which is a rare circumstance for me, um, to say that it's important to understand that pensions are benefits that belong to workers, not to the city of Vancouver. So when they, when a, a union or an individual signs a contract with the city of Vancouver around their, um, their employment, we give them a wage. We would never presume to tell them where to spend that wage. If they want to go buy weapons, tobacco, and oil and gas, that's <laughs> unfortunate, but that is their prerogative to do that. And pensions are not functionally different. Um, they're managed in a different way. Um, but ultimately, it's part of the employment benefits that an individual receives and that they should have some right of determination over. So at this point, we're, we're understanding that and looking at what framework we can use for next steps. I'm very much hoping that Mark is going to use some of his eight minutes to explain the structure of the pension funds um, in the province of British Columbia and the legal requirements around them, because there's there's a lot of rocks and a whole lot of hard place in that discussion, um, and where I hope we can have some dialogue about how you, nav how you navigate that ethically, and then also understanding that there are legal barriers to some sort of obvious ethical next steps on that front. And okay, it, and that is time. it. Thank you me. are completely on time. Mark, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, thank you to Carbon Talks for, for hosting. Um, and to SFU, I, I st actually studied uh, ecological economics and environmental economics uh, 20 years ago when I was a grad student at SFU. And a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past few years with the Climate Justice Project, which is looking at sort of how we make the leap to a, a zero carbon uh, economy, uh, is really anchored in, in those days. So it's a real pleasure to be back here. I will make one confession, is that when I was a, a teenager, 
I wanted to be a banker. Um, I had kind of a weird upbringing. I went to like a Upper Canada College, a sort of elite private school in Toronto, and I went to school with all these kids who were like, you know, super rich kids from uh, from banking families. So I had some really uh, weird peer pressure. I think that was happening when I was a kid. But this is a way of sort of indulging my uh, the teenage me in, in thinking about uh, financial markets. Um, so I think. In the work that I've been doing, you know, we, we've done a lot of research looking at how we make this transition and uh, you know, what are the positive investments we should be making to transform our economy into the one that I think a lot of us in the, around the room here uh, would want, um, you know, a truly equitable and sustainable economy. I feel like the past few years uh, we've been sliding a bit and we've, I've spent more of my time playing defense, uh, arguing against uh, the Enbridge pipeline or LNG facilities. And I feel like we are here in BC very much at this carbon crossroads. Um, you know, we are making choices about do we lock in another generation worth of fossil fuel infrastructure? You know, that, that really locks in our economy on a particular path that we know is really not the one we, sh we should be on. Or do we start to make alternative green infrastructure investments in building the economy we want? And, and when I look at, at uh, Canada and I look at, uh, at the world, I see the same dynamic playing out uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, you know, on a national scale, it's much more about uh, pipelines and, and the tar sands, you know, in all different directions in our relationships with the United States, uh, the Keystone XL pipeline forms that. Uh, when you look at the, you know, almost 400,000 people in the, in the streets of New York City uh, this past weekend, uh, we're seeing that manifest in various ways. And I think divestment is just another uh, version of that. But I think actually at heart, the divestment movement that we've seen in all its various forms is really about this choice about which infrastructure uh, we build. Where do we put our collective investment efforts? Uh, and is it digging deeper, deeper, deeper until the whole of fossil fuels or is it uh, in, in something else? So we're divesting from one thing, but we're investing uh, in, in other stuff. Um, I think there's a, there's a powerful moral case to be made uh, around divestment and uh, climate change and the impacts this is having and extreme weather events and the, the distribution uh, of those changes. Um, but for me, I'm, as an economist, I'm really interested in, in the economic case. Is there sort of an economic or financial case uh, to uh, divestment? And so the, the work that I've done, uh, we published a, a paper called Canada's Carbon Liabilities, which came about a year and a half ago, which you can download off our website, which is policyalternatives.ca, uh, co-authored with a, a, a great uh, MA student in the Masters of Public Policy program here at SFU. So another connection there. Um, and we looked at, uh, at this case. And so coming back to the idea of ecological economics, which is the idea that the economy operates within you know, a biosphere, uh, as opposed to the economic models that are uh, the standard uh, that are taught in undergrad and graduate courses where it's completely abstracted from, from anything like that. Um, when it, we talk about climate change, what we're really interested in is uh, uh, the idea of a carbon budget. That is that, you know, moving forward, there's a finite amount of carbon we can take from underground and put into the atmosphere. Uh, there's, we have to live within <coughs> limits. And I think this is interesting because we all know about budgets from our own personal lives. We know about budgets from a, a, a financial management perspective, provincially and federally. And I think we need to be applying that concept to how we think about uh, fossil fuels and, and carbon. Now, how big is that carbon budget? Well, you know, it all depends. Um, there's a, a range of estimates for what that carbon budget is. Uh, and a, a lot of it depends on, on how cautious we want to be with regard to the future. Um, for international negotiations, the formal target has been to keep global temperature increase uh, limited to or below uh, two degrees of warming relative to pre-industrial levels. And we're almost sort of halfway there uh, already. Um, if we want to have a, you know, a two-thirds chance of staying below two degrees, so two-thirds chance, you know, two out of three chance, um, we can combust about 30 years of global emissions at current rates. Now, I think the, the prudent thing, given uh, Hurricane Sandy and what we've seen in the Philippines and the, and the ongoing uh, you know, drought in California and all of these things is that we should actually do it much more, more quickly. Um, but 30 years, I think, is a, a you know, reasonable uh, bet in terms of, uh, of being, you know, very, um, uh, of thinking about well, how our reserves of fossil fuels 
compared to that budget? And the answer is that uh, we have way more um, fossil fuels than we can safely combust. So the idea of kind of, you know, peak oil driving all this, I think is actually a, a bit of a red herring. Uh, we have, uh, you know, five times uh, as much reserves uh, as we have an available carbon budget. So that 80% of what we know about essentially needs to stay in the ground. Now my report looked at what this, you know, means for Canada. Uh, Canada has a disproportionate share of fossil fuel reserves. Our whole industrial strategy is around the extraction and exploitation of those reserves. And the, the reserves that we do have, we have a lot of coal and we have a lot of bitumen, which are the two dirtiest fossil fuels to have in your portfolio, as it were. Um, if you look at the math and you think, well, what's Canada's plausible share of this global you know, carbon budget? And you can say, well, you know, what's our share of global population? What's our share of global GDP? What's our share of the reserves we have in ground? Any which way you slice it, um, most of the reserves we know about have to stay uh, underground. Um, there was a recent study by uh, Carbon Tracker International, and these were the folks that first brought up the idea of a carbon bubble. Um, and they looked at, um, at the costs associated with getting oil to market. Um, and with the argument that, you know, only a certain amount of that is going to be able to come on market and the rest needs to stay below ground. So it's the highest cost producers um, that are going to be uh, squeezed out of this market. And guess where the highest cost producers end up being? The tar sands in Alberta. Um, so this you know, poses, I think, you know, huge challenges between business as usual models, which are predicated on the extraction and exploitation of those fossil fuels, and something that lives within this finite budget and, uh, and gets us to where we want to be a few years uh, uh, down the road. Uh, another thing we looked at in the carbon liabilities paper was that, you know, if you actually take that uh, carbon out of the ground and put it into the atmosphere, it causes damages. They, in the economics, they call this the social cost of carbon. But it, the, it's the idea of an external cost. It's not born in the market price of that product. It's a cost that's imposed on people whose homes are destroyed in the Philippines or people whose uh, land is eroded by, by sea level rise. And when you look at the value of that, even just you know, for Canadian listed companies on the TSX, uh, it totally dwarfs the assets or market capitalization uh, of those particular companies. So we're at this interesting point in history. I gotta wrap up, um, but I think the divestment movement has, you know, it's really only been around for a couple years and has had, you know, huge momentum. I could have used my whole eight minutes just talking about the interesting things that happened this week, and maybe we can get at that in the uh, in the discussion. But uh, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation have uh, decided to divest. From, and this is the, they made their money, Standard Oil, on oil. So it's, it's really interesting. Stanford has uh, agreed to divest from a coal. The Unitarian Church uh, is divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, Norway's pension fund uh, is divesting uh, as well. Uh, there are great campus campaigns happening at UBC uh, and at Simon Fraser University with the Divest uh, SFU campaign, which I understand has uh, 100 faculty members that signed uh, an open letter calling on the, uh, the endowment to be divested. Uh, uh, the, those folks are also looking for a fossil-free pension option for their, uh, for their investments. Uh, and there's a great student campaign happening as well. Um, there's also, so there, that's kind of the Devon side, there's also some interesting things happening around engagement. So you have uh, last year, 77 institutional investors representing $3 trillion in capital um, made a request of all of the, the kind of carbon majors to say, well, how do you square your business plans with this kind of harsh reality around a carbon budget? And the answer was basically like, well, you know, we don't think it's going to be a problem. Uh, we don't think the world's going to, governments are going to get their act together for uh, keeping temperature increase uh, to two degrees. So essentially what that means is, um, you know, the fight for the future uh, is on. Uh, BC is on the, on the front lines uh, of those fights. And uh, I think this is a really important conversation to be having. Whether you favor engagement with those companies or you favor divestment, we need to have more and more of these conversations. So thank you for having me here. Thanks, Mark. That was great. Jamie, over to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, up front, I will apologize for being the only one with a PowerPoint. And uh, not only that, but uh, the time I've been given means that I'm going to fly through this and barely even talk to him. So uh, again, we'll start with we're a retail mutual fund. Uh, if you like what you hear, buy our product. 
so the carbon bubble, stranded assets. Um, this has been the fastest moving debate that I've seen in my eight years in the industry by far. Uh, carbon Tracker uh, should, act, should be commended for putting together what uh, I think is a wonderfully elegant uh, thesis, uh, really capsulizes things uh, very well. Oops, sorry, do I need to talk into this more? Does that work? Okay. Uh, yes, they should be commended, uh, and the risks that it poses are real and demand attention. Uh, I have been asked to provide a, a critique, if you want, of the divestment campaign, and so uh, I will. But I should say up front that uh, it is already a success. Like we're in this room talking about how investments impact climate change. Uh, this is a discussion that has not happened at the institutional level in the last 20 years. Uh, and so the fact that we're having it, uh, already a success. But uh, there are things that could be improved. So in terms of the investment campaign, some of the challenges I see is that the actual odds of influence in the companies themselves and the top investors is pretty slim. So what you have here is a slide of the top 25 oil and gas companies uh, and the top 25 investors in those companies. So that's just 25 companies, 25 investors. This represents about a trillion in assets under management. That's almost a quarter of all the investments in the oil and gas uh, world uh, uh, writ large. Um, and if you look at some of the names in there, you have the Russian government, Colombian government, you have the Chinese National Oil Company, uh, some very major mainstream investors. The odds of us influencing them are pretty slim, realistically. Uh, and if you can't move them, then in, you, your odds of moving the price of the company is fairly slim. Um, and uh, in terms of... Um, most people in the, in the movement so far have acknowledged that that's not actually really the basic goal. The goal is to shame and stigmatize the industry to a point where there's pressure on the political elites to create some kind of policy movement. Uh, and my, my fear around that is the risk of polarization. I mean, polarization tends to lead to stagnation in terms of debate. Um, and I think we should be really careful about where we go with this debate to make sure that we don't create more entrenched camps. Uh, and I take as the example that most of the major energy companies in, the, in Canada right now are publicly on board with the idea of a price on carbon. Uh, the fact our government hasn't put it in place is a question I can't answer. Uh, however, we have to ask ourselves, do we need this industry on board to make an effective price of carbon a reality? And if so, uh, will the effort to stigmatize them impact on that at all? Uh, and then finally, in terms of does shaming the supplier reduce the demand? I'm not sure it does, but we can get into that in more detail, uh, hopefully in the question period. Uh, one of the other things I'd like to, to talk about is the tobacco campaign. It has been cited as an inspiration at times for the investment campaign. Uh, and it's absolutely been successful in stigmatizing the industry. I don't know if there's a more vilified corporate citizen out there than a, a tobacco company. However, I, I think if you look at some of what's happened, it should give us pause. Uh, so, What's happened is there's been a consolidation. So they've either turned private or uh, the market has turned over to state-owned enterprises, um, both of which are immune to investors or any kind of public pressure for that matter. Uh, it's amazingly profitable. Uh, you can see on this slide. Uh, and um, at the end of the day, the rate of smoking hasn't really changed. Um, is that this, worldwide? That is worldwide. Uh, and it's, I mean, the reason it's gone up is population. So the actual rate has more or less stayed the same. It's gone down Western society and gone up in the developing world. Uh, and the analogy I want to drive here is that already uh, state-owned enterprises have a huge influence in the oil markets today, uh, also coal as well. Um, and if we drive the markets towards a place where state-owned enterprises have even more control, uh, they become even more immune from uh, any kind of pressure, really, for that matter. Um, in terms of, uh, if not divestment, um, then what? Uh, and so we do have uh, a strategy in place. This is the framework that we need to see uh, in order for that energy transition to happen, in our opinion. But just take from this, uh, the one thing I would take from this is that every day that goes by that we don't have a price on carbon and that we're burning carbon without any money going towards future energy possibilities is a, a, a day further away from getting to a credible transition. Uh, so we do have uh, a strategy, um, and so I, I don't want to just critique divestment. Uh, I think there are, there are other alternatives. Um, and I would give a brief comment to this slide is that we are definitely in the minority in terms of having a strategy at all. 
Uh, and I think that's an important point to make. So uh, bringing greater numbers along will increase and amplify the impact that we can have. Um, so this, uh, and in terms of what that looks like. And so we do exclude companies um, across all sectors, as well as uh, the oil and gas sector itself. Um, in terms of uh, what that looks like in reality there is, so if you look at the upstream oil and gas companies, people who are bringing it out of the ground, uh, about half of those don't make it into our funds. They're not eligible. Um, we have expectations that uh, they don't meet. And we have yet to meet uh, a coal company that qualifies for our funds. So we don't actually hold them. We do, however, own energy companies. Uh, and what we do with them is engage. And so we have a vision for the companies in our portfolio. Uh, and uh, the way I see it panning out is that we'll have fewer and fewer of those companies actually in our portfolio, but they will broaden uh, and diversify to meet our actual expectations. Uh, I think an understatement to say we're not there yet. Um, however, uh, if you look at, I've just put some of the, what we would call some of the victories of our campaigns. Uh, this has been achieved, and I really want to put this out, with a very, very small subset of investors. Sometimes a subset of one, uh, ourselves. Uh, and so, uh, th if we can actually uh, amplify how many investors are taking this seriously, then uh, I think the, uh, the amount of change we can have will uh, also be amplified. Um, and I should point out, in terms of engagement, if people aren't familiar with that, it's basically using the tools you have as an investor, the responsibilities you get, the, some of the privileges you have to influence corporates uh, through dialogue, in our case. Uh, oh, this is just another slide talking about uh, one of the key points we have around our current engagement with energy industry is about innovation. Uh, it's been sorely lacking. Uh, and as you can see here from the time we started our engagement, there's actually been a dramatic increase in the amount of spending on R&D and, uh, and, and just in terms of how companies orient themselves towards innovation. Uh, innovation will be absolutely key if we are to have any kind of hope of making the transition. And so that is millions of dollars in research and development uh, being spent. So that's the change over the years. Uh, and importantly, what I'd like to point out here is uh, we also engage across the demand side, so all the other sectors in our portfolio, because it is about demand as well. And if you're not talking to that side of the equation, you're not getting really the full picture here. I will fly through the rest. Uh, if there's anything that uh, is obvious is that we need policy. Uh, we're very active on this front. We've had, let's say, 10 different climate-related submissions in the last few years. Uh, we are one of the few who do this. Uh, I think it has a, a, a significant impact. And this is a snapshot of our website. Uh, so all of our submissions are available. You can read them word for word. Uh, this is the kind of transparency we demand from companies and uh, we expect it of ourselves. Uh, for those of you uh, who are uh, working on campaigns with various institutions, I would demand that same kind of accountability from them. Uh, I don't have time to talk to this. The Boyle Forest is very important. We must keep it around. <laughs> And final thoughts I'd like to get to, and if I could leave you with this one thought, investor responsibilities do not end at carbon. All of these issues are critical, and uh, you cannot choose which responsibilities you want to act on. You have to act on them all if you're going to be a responsible investor. And my fear is if we focus too much on the divestment campaign, we're going to actually let some people ride just because they sold the stock of a few fossil fuel companies, and uh, that would be a shame. And so let's keep, keep our eye on the ball that all of these issues are important and that we need uh, comprehensive, responsible investment strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic presentations. So some great food for thought. Let's see who has questions. Okay, I'm gonna take one, George two, and one other. Okay, let's start with three. Okay, so let's get your questions out. If, if I can ask each of the presenters to take note of the questions, we're gonna take all three questions out at the same time and uh, go from there. Thanks. Uh, following up on James' comments about alternatives, uh, years ago, Greenpeace bought shares back Bill and Bloedel during the time of the Clayquot Sound threat of logging and went to the shareholder meetings and were activist shareholders. So is another strategy having 100 SFU academics instead of saying divest, become activist shareholders on part of the university, go to those shareholder meetings and offer alternatives to divestment versus risking them getting all these state oil companies 
uh, free from uh, review. Okay, so shareholder activism question. I'm going to go over here and then I'll come over, George. I recognize that the divestment um, movement is, is quite new by the sounds of it, and I'm just wondering if there are any examples um, worldwide or whatever of divestment successful problems, that sort of thing. And now I'll just do a quick run. <laughs> okay, I'm not running, but you know, you get it. Hi, I'm George Hoberg at UBC, and I'm involved in the divestment campaign there. And my questions for uh, Jamie, you talk about the risk of polarization and kind of a backlash from pushing for divestment. And I think the main argument you're using there is that it's already been successful in part because so many oil companies and fossil fuel companies are, are admitting we need to price carbon. But I'm actually not aware, I agree with that, uh, that, that fact, I'm not aware that they're asking for carbon policies or demanding from government carbon policies that will actually get us to the two degree target. And, and, I, and I think that's a, a because of that, I, I really question the logic of that polarization um, criticism you're making. Who wants to begin? Jamie, you've got a number, but I think there's also for Mark and Andrea as well, so. You can go in reverse order. So, so Jamie, why don't we go with you first? Uh, okay, so starting with the uh, question about uh, corporate activism. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, I mean, absolutely, we need more voices. Uh, I, I think that is uh, definitely a fact. Um, I will, the only, the only hedge I'd put on that is that uh, a large part of the influence we have as shareholders is that we do actually share the vision uh, in terms of uh, if the company does well, we do well, right? Like that is a shared goal. And um, there, there has been a number of NGOs kind of moving into this space. My fear around that is, um, you may marginalize some of the investors like ourselves who are bringing these up, but we do it in the long-term interests of the company as opposed to, um, I guess, a campaign tactic. Uh, and you know, maybe that's neither here nor there, but, uh, but I, I do feel that the strength of our argument comes from having a shared goal. Um, now, should I speak to all three or just carry yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the second one was on examples of divestment success. Uh, there, there are a number of, um, at the university and as well as the city level uh, that have done this. Uh, I think closest to home is Seattle, who has uh, made this decision. Uh, and there's a number of others out there. Uh, the, the only caution I would put to that is um, one of the, and it, and it goes to what, uh, why people invest in oil and gas in the first place, is that there are characteristics of an oil and gas investment that investors are looking for. Um, uh, one of which, uh, as Andrew mentioned, is liquidity, the ability to get in and out without any kind of penalty, um, the scale of the investment, uh, the opportunity for growth, and uh, yield, which is about getting dividends from companies. Um, it's really hard to find any other sector that provides all of those. So replacing the oil and gas um, in terms of divestment it can't, it doesn't actually fit right into, say, renewables. Like, you can't just do a bang, bang, like switch right to renewables because it doesn't actually meet those same characteristics. And those investors do still have a fiduciary duty to their unit holders to provide a return. So um, it, it's just complicated, really, is all I'm saying. But there are a number of institutions that have gone down this route, absolutely. Uh, and then the last one was on the polarization and that uh, companies aren't asking for uh, a carbon price that gets us to two degrees. Uh, and I, uh, I agree, <laughs> they aren't. Uh, but I guess my point is that um, I think, to, to me, my theory of change is that the, the only way to get rid of oil is we find a better alternative. Um, we're not gonna punish it out of the market. Like, I don't think any government's gonna take the steps necessary to do that. I just think that's flat non-starter. But if we can get to the point where we can drive enough innovation to create alternatives that make the need for fossil fuels uh, obsolete. I really think that is the goal. And, and for me, and maybe it's, maybe I have limited ambition. I, I just want to get it started. I, I want to get that price in carbon in there. I want to get money flowing to where it should be going. I want uh, those market signals to be there. And um, it's true that going with what an energy company would, would go along with won't get us to a two degree target in terms of played out. But I think the thing with the market and with innovation is that once it gets rolling, it's really hard to stop. 
And the, the hope is that once we start that, we will get there. And, and uh, I mean, maybe it doesn't quite answer your question, but uh, I fear with the polarization, what I'm afraid of is if we never even get that, that first ball rolling. So that's all. Mark, why don't you go ahead? Um, thanks. Uh, well, I think you know one of the interesting areas, and Andrew mentioned it, is around pension funds. Um, you know, it's one thing for the you know Rockefeller brothers to say we're divesting because they can do whatever they want with their money. Uh, you know, pension funds. There's a sort of a legal you know regime uh, around them, and I, and it's a lot of you probably all heard the concept of fiduciary duty, um, which basically means you have to make as much money for your your members as as possible. And I think what's interesting about fiduciary duty in the context of pension funds is that uh, you have to treat all of your members equally. That is, you know, the existing retiree base you have, the near to be retired, and the 25-year-old that just started working in the mailroom or wherever the 25-year-olds work these days. Um, they <laughs> probably not getting a pension if they're working in the mailroom. Okay, okay, um, that's a whole other debate. Um, but so, in order, if you if you're uh, managing those funds on behalf of that 25-year-old, um, you have to be asking the question: Is having investments in fossil fuels upholding the fiduciary duty to that young person? I would argue no. And I, so I think this is actually a, a key wedge. I don't think we've seen too much action on it. I did mention that Norway's uh, uh, pension fund has divested, but I think by and large, uh, the pension fund world is, is, is living in a state of, of uh, soft denial. They may accept the, uh, the, the science on climate change, uh, but they don't accept the need to, uh, to do anything about it. And I don't think that their perception of risk around uh, governments getting together and hammering out a new deal that constrains carbon over the next you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, there are also risks associated with First Nations land claims, with legal liability, and these are starting to be tracked through various uh, studies. Uh, all of these things need to be a part of the consideration of risk in the same way that there's a risk of a coup in Guatemala or there's a risk of inflation or there's a risk of changes in commodity prices. So these need to be part of the, the conversation. And I think the, um, there's a, an important role, I wouldn't necessarily call it shareholder activism, but I think for, uh, for example, for trade union members uh, who are involved in their pension fund to start asking these difficult questions about how their money is being invested on their uh, behalf. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. There's a whole bunch of other things I could say, but we need more conversation and less me. Andrea. Oh, well, I'm finding that, Jamie, you talking about not polarizing it is somehow polarizing me. So I'm, I'm trying, to, <laughs> <laughs> trying to, like, not be polarized on it. Um, on the questions, um, the shareholder activism, you used the example of the MacBlo shares. Um, I, it might be selective memory, but was part of that, that world and campaign. I cannot remember us winning a single vote. Our purpose in buying those shares was for theater, not for, I mean, we wanted the stage, and the belly of the beast, the backdrop, and that was phenomenally successful in terms of moving governments and shareholders and ultimately the company right out of the province, which may or may not have been the best thing, but it certainly it achieved an outcome. In the Wilderness Committee, I remember in 2002, we, uh, we did up a video. At the time, YouTube didn't exist, so this was actually an incredibly challenging exercise to <laughs> create a video, post it online. Um, and within an hour, I had a call from the company. It was about Tech Comenco, a mining company that wanted to open up a provincial park to logging, or sorry, mining. It'd be really funny if it was logging. Well, probably ironically funny, given that they're a mining company. But um, <laughs> within an hour of it going up, I had Tech Comenco's senior vice president calling me saying, what will it take to get that video down? Because it was affecting their stock price, because it was images of what would happen to that park. People Google Tech Comenco because they're interested in the stock, and that's what they saw. So I, I appreciate that shareholder activism has had some value out there. In my experience, activism activism has had a <laughs> tremendous amount of value out there. Um, in terms of the divestment success, I mean, South Africa is a sort of obvious example, but that's a pretty, there was a long fight there and a lot of human suffering, but there was a lot of human suffering happening one way or the other, and that's the sort of equation you have to look at. I would say as governments, um, you know, we're talking about 
uh, whether or not I, sort of an ethical, on one level, this moral question of where should our money be and perhaps how I framed it up. Um, but there's this very practical question about how you're driving investments. So um, the Metro Vancouver banned organics in your garbage as of 2015. Um, that will have the effect of banning organics in your garbage, but what's really been happening in the three years since it was announced is a massive movement of investment in waste infrastructure um, towards how to process those organics, how to capture them. Like we, we've created literally several thousand jobs in the region as a result of that overnight through one policy decision, right? Should we take the bold action to say, um, and we have in the city of Vancouver, that we are banning fossil fuels being burned on this planet as of, choose a date, we chose 2050, no specific date in the year, but we'll get to that. Um, you are then, if enough governments did that, you're moving the investments over. So I don't, um, I don't think that's polarized. I mean, you have a, a group of us, and I'm guessing they're those of us sitting in this room who are saying, hey, we choose life. Um, and on the other side, you have companies that constructive engagement or not, they want to invest in decades of infrastructure to literally lay the pipe for 60 years of almost certain death on this planet. And that's, it, it's, yeah, it's polarized. Um, but I think it demands, um, it demands therefore for us to step up in the, in the biggest way we can to create the space for a dialogue, but also urgent action while we're undertaking that dialogue. Okay, we have three more questions. They're all three are here. We're going to go one, two, and three, and then I'll come back to the other questions. Hi, my question is for Jamie. I was just wondering what timeline you're looking at in terms of your investments there. Are you looking like five-year timeline, 10-year timeline? Because I'm 29, which means that by the time I retire, if there is a fossil fuel industry, our planet will literally be cooked. So for me, divestment is a really practical strategy to keep my investment money safe because there are going to be a lot of stranded assets and there is going to be a lot of money lost and I don't want to be left holding the bag when the fossil fuel industry collapses. I guess my question is addressed to Mark because you're the only one that mentioned carbon budgeting. Uh, and I'm sort of looking at it a much broader view. And that is how much do we need? How much carbon can we not live without in order to manage our city of Vancouver? I know that traveling in the Arctic it's entirely diesel dependent. You get nothing. You have no power. You can't have water. You can't have anything because if you don't have diesel, you're not, you don't have solar, you don't have geothermal, you don't have access to those alternatives. And you don't have to go very far north for that to happen. So we know ultimately what those communities need, what they need in order to function. How much does Vancouver need to function? Also, there, I saw one of the divest SFU, and I promised you get a question. So which one of you is going to ask it? And we're going to do it after this question. So there'll be four questions this round. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. I'm going to ask the kind of question that I hate hearing other people ask, which is kind of a mumbling mess. Um, but I guess I'm just thinking it's sort of a 30,000 foot up question, which is, what is the frame that we're using to think through divestment and who it's really directed at? Um, I appreciated Councillor Reimer's uh, description of the Greenpeace shareholder activism as theater because, um, you know, speaking of ways of thinking through economics, there's a whole school of thought um, centered around Michel Callan, some fancy French guy, who says that economics is essentially a performance. So, you know, the market doesn't actually have a reality that exists outside the performances, i.e. the decisions of people around the world. And so that brings up the question, I'm, Jamie, you mentioned the idea that, you know, maybe shaming isn't the way to, to, to do it. And I'm wondering if, I don't disagree that there's an aspect of shaming in divestment, but I'm wondering if the goal actually isn't to shame um, companies, but it's actually to shame government. That's actually what I've been noticing is that we're starting to see business asking government to start regulating, be it through command and control or, or pricing or whatever. So I'm wondering if, Divestment isn't actually is actually about using markets as a as a tool of getting the regulators to regulate. Thank you. Okay, and one last question from the Divest SFU group, and we're going to go. Excuse me, right in here. Excuse me for. Thank you. 
Um, so my question is to Andrea. Um, you mentioned that um, investing into renewable energies, for example, would be um, challenging because um, there would be more risk and less liquidity in um, the case um, that you were talking about. So um, I was wondering how you would ensure that your investments, um, by, by reinvesting in um, different institutions, you would um, meet your fiduciary duty because um, this is something that um, I think people who have been considering divestment have been worried about. So how you would make sure that your new investments would be well placed. everyone and over to the three um, we're gonna go we're gonna go one more because we've got one Twitter question and then that's gonna be the last set of questions and I just want to make sure somebody from the Twitter world gets to ask a question so this comes from at Vienne LeBlanc divestment in fossil fuels is supposed to reduce demand but won't it just free these investments for other buyers okay let's start with you Andrea and come back this way um, well, so I'll start with the, the divest SFU question. So um, the idea behind, uh, consider that right now we don't have anything invested in fossil fuel, so we don't have to, we, we don't have to have a divestment discussion. We just have to have to talk about what investment looks for us moving forward. Um, so negative screen, zero future fossil fuels, tobacco, weapons, other things inconsistent. Um, and then of what the, the money that we have, which is right now about $1.1 $1 billion that we invest every year, um, we would decide which percentage of it goes into the best in class side of things and what percentage goes into the positive screen, so the renewable. So you're, you're limiting your risk. You could say, if you're extremely risk intolerant, which governments probably should be, they are responsible for providing water and sewer and trans, like important stuff, right? So you want to protect your investment as much as possible. Um, so we could carve off a 1% or 2% and then over time, the thing of it is our own investment will make that a more stable investment over time. So so that's the that's the beauty of it, but the challenge is who goes first and how you how you go in. Um, very different than a pension fund. Important to note that not on my list was rate of return. We're not that, we're much more concerned about the risk our money has and the liquidity, whereas a pension fund would be also equally if not more concerned about rate of return on the money. Um, we just want a safe place to put our money. If it gets a return, that's good, but not at the expense of those other two things. Um, I'll try and pick off a couple of these other ones. There was a question about the carbon dependence. I know it was for Mark, but I might I, I note that 50% of our transit currently runs on electricity, um, a fact most people don't think about, but we have a lot of people already moving around. Um, so if you add up the walkers, the bikers, and the people on transit, half of them on electrical, we're already doing substantial um, things that we think of as carbon dependent in a non-carbon dependent way. Um, and lots more opportunity there to do more with those other investments in it. Um, Divestment, the whole concept of shaming government. Um, governments cannot be shamed to do, to not do something that people are doing. So as long, if, if you're acting in a way contradictory to the ask you're making of government, um, it's very difficult for a government to square that. So I put another way, as long as you're investing in fossil fuels, it's very hard to explain to government why you think that's not okay for them, um, as long as you're buying uh, large amounts of fossil fuels to heat your home or to, in, unless the issue is that you don't have another alternative, right? So that's where um, governments look to see the kinds of choices people are making. Our government's chosen a bit of a different path, but we're relatively unusual in that in terms of the leadership that we're trying to push on it. Um, I think if you were looking for something, um, yeah, I, I don't think shame is a powerful motivator. I do think the truth is, and I think that we shy away from that discussion. I mean, this is not, we're talking in theoreticals and, you know, in a fairly academic way, probably appropriate for the venue. Um, but the harsh reality of this is we talked about the, um, the, the exciting things this week in divestment. I could give you a terrifying list this week of weather disasters, health disasters, evacuations, refugees from environmental degradation. Like, this is not... It's not something we talk about because it makes us sigh heavily, um, but if that's the discussion we were having at the same time we're talking about divestment or other climate policy, I think it would be a very different discussion that we're having. Mark, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, federally and provincially, our governments have no shame when it comes to this stuff. I mean, it's, you know, it's embarrassing. I'm so proud to live in the city of Vancouver where I can at least have one level of government that I feel good about what we're doing. Um, the question on, on Twitter was a, was a good one. I think it relates back to Amy's comment before, is, is who's holding the bag? I mean, if your pension fund divests and the Koch brothers buy up that stock and then a new deal comes in which undermines the value of their investments, great. <laughs> you know, uh, let them hold the bag on, on this. I, I, have, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, it, you know, on the straight up kind of investment mechanics of it all, there's some new kind of indices that are being developed. There's the fossil free index and the, you know, Financial Times uh, stock exchange has this one where they've stripped out fossil fuels and basically they perform uh, you know, equivalently to the ones that have the fossil fuels in them. And particularly coal has sort of been underperforming the market anyway. So there's coal, especially there's a good reason to divest forgetting about any of the moral arguments, you know, uh, uh, whatsoever. So, you know, there is some interesting market dynamics around this. A lot of this is being driven by changes in energy markets themselves and natural gas, but also the economics of renewables are becoming increasingly favorable. I'd recommend a report by a Bloomberg New Energy Finance. There's a bunch of the stuff in Jamie's talk that came out of that one, uh, just came out about a month ago, and it's a free download, and it gives you a real good sense of where divestment is, the, the money that we're talking about, and where we're at in terms of the alternatives and clean energy investments and, and stuff like that. But, you know, there's, it's growing. There's, uh, you know, two to three hundred billion dollars invested in clean energy uh, every year. I think some of the vehicles for making this happen are still not quite where we want them to be, but the, but it's happening. And I think, you know, there's some really interesting things to do if we just think about this even on a local level. One of my favorite examples is here in Vancouver, the Neighborhood Energy Utility, which is a, a district energy system they built in Southeast Falls Creek. 70% uh, of the energy comes from sewage heat recapture. So it's basically this free resource that's been there. It's just water that's been heated up in toilet bowls and pipes all day long, which comes into the system. They use heat pumps to harvest that heat, and that's what it is. The trick is that it needs an upfront capital investment, uh, and it, the, these things can be pretty large. In the case of the, the NEU, they were able to get a, a grant from the feds. They were able to get you know a few other breaks here and there, but th this is a real barrier for a lot of communities that are thinking about going down this path. So we, we, we have places where we need to invest that money. We just need to create the connections to, to make that happen. Uh, green bonds being a great example. And I think, you know, transportation is another area where we need to go and do that in a big way. I'm only standing because we're that short of time and I want to give Jamie as well a chance to respond. Okay, well, I'll just pick off a couple of those, um, I guess. In terms of the timeline investments, uh, I mean, the reason why I, I said I really like the carbon tracker thesis is because we are taking it seriously. I mean, I, I do think that there comes a point where you will cross a line where you are exposed to these risks. I don't believe that that, that is today, um, but I think if you're not thinking seriously about it, then you are doing a disservice to uh, whoever you have a fiduciary duty to. Uh, and so uh, in terms of our timelines for when that happens, I, I, mean, I can't answer that exactly, uh, other than to say that that is the plan, is to reduce our exposure to it, and ideally by dragging some of these companies uh, into the next century in terms of uh, a new form of energy. Um, that's the hope, but either way, uh, we will diminish our exposure. And uh, a cold's a good example, I would agree. Uh, it kind of feels like it's on its way out already, um, and uh, I doubt it'll find its way into our portfolio again, uh, and it's not there now. So um, we're already there with coal. I think the risks are, are that present. Um, uh, before I get cut off, uh, thank you so much for reminding me that one of my slides in there was from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. I forgot to even like, say that. Uh, the one about the 25 oil and gas companies, uh, and so uh, credit to them. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, and I have no more time. You have no more time. <laughs> Part you. of what our promise to you is get you in on time and out on time. So I want to say I thought this was a fabulous and very thoughtful and impassioned conversation and I certainly learned from it so I want to thank each of you for what you've brought um, and I know that there's a lot of expertise in the room as well and want to thank you for that as well a big thank you to uh, PIX to the Center for Dialogue and North Growth Foundation and to each of you for coming um, next time and this is uh, take a look if you haven't had a chance to sign one of the the uh, 
sign-ins. We will make sure you get the information on our next Carbon Talks, and we are going to be looking more deeply at the role of private sector in district energy systems. So what's that role that the private sector plays in that renewable space of district energy? Thanks again.